They said that I would never be able to have a real job. They said that I would probably have to live in institutions for the rest of my life, and that if I carry on using, I'll probably die within the next three, four months. It destroyed my family's life for nearly 10 years. My mother said she wanted to fall asleep and never wake up again. And my father said he was already practicing my funeral speech towards the end. My name is Jared Smith, and this is my story. Experimenting with alcohol from a young age of 13, and that's how the whole addiction was born. You know, you can't become a drug addict or an alcoholic without trying drugs or drinking. I got expelled from school. I was told by my headmaster that I'd either be famous or go to jail. And when I got involved into gangsterism, they almost told me to not steal from your family, but to steal from other people. And that's where I started breaking into other people's houses. I started stealing people's cars, started doing credit card fraud. Um, there were times where the police would come and search us and we would hide drugs in between our bum cheeks. There were many different situations where I was found that the police would come into a guy's house where we'd be sitting, they would raid, they would sometimes hit us, we'd have to run away. From that point, I was arrested seven times in my life, living on the streets, sleeping on two crates in a cardboard box. Uh, my teeth went off. Um, my parents said they'd give me three months to live and I was washing myself out of a basin maybe once every three days. So getting to a place where I realized literally that I was dying was my lowest point where I had to face the choices that I'd made in my life and came to a pretty much death and I had to choose. And when I fetched him at the police station on that 15th of Feb, all he had was worldly possessions, a pair of shoes, a pair of black socks, cut off jeans and a black vest. He said to me, I need help. So I gave him the cell phone and I said, you know the phone number. You phone, I'm not phoning on your behalf anymore. I've done enough for you. That's where I had to beg my father to go to rehab again. And I had to say to him, please send me. And he, you know, I've been to rehab eight times. My, my parents nearly spent a million rand on me over 10 years trying to help me. Lynn, he was talking to Lynn and uh, he burst out uh, crying and couldn't carry on and gave me the phone. And she said, uh, what's the story? I said, the wheels are off. And she said, that's perfect. That's where we need it. When I went to Serenity the last time, the first eight weeks were very tough. You know, I said to my father that, that, that that's enough. I, I you know, don't want to do it anymore. And I ended up running away from Serenity with four guys, breaking out showing them how to inject tech into their, arms, into their arms and stealing people's cell phones. And then, you know, we came back to Serenity and I was back at square one saying, but you know, you made this promise to your father. And that's where I started really searching for God and Jesus Christ, just you know, saying, please help me. And I started asking one of the counselors there, his name was Monty. I said, you know, tell me a little bit more, more about Jesus Christ and about God. And he took me off the farm into a forest and he, and he said, sit here and tell God everything that's in your heart. Don't worry about how you say it or what you say. He understands exactly what you're saying. So it was more about a relationship with Jesus Christ than being in religion. I went into my room and I just got on my knees and I said, God, please, I don't want to be like this anymore. And in that moment, I can't explain what happened. My life just, like a miracle, my life just changed. I believe that grace isn't an easy process. You know, grace means that we have to accept and admit that we've done something wrong. So I've gone through a process over the last seven years of, a, of often admitting to God that, you know, this is my mistakes, these are my faults. And he's been able to time and time again show grace. And it's been difficult. It hasn't always been easy, you know. But the, great, the graceful thing in my life is that when God changed my life, he took away my whole addiction. I don't crave drugs. I don't think about drugs. And that's just a miracle in itself. That destruction and that lifestyle that I lived gave me such a big gift that I'm able to help people today. Out of four friends, one was murdered and two went to prison, and I'm the fourth one. So it's only by grace that I'm able to share my story. He's managed to turn his life around. In fact, it's probably true to say he's done a complete metamorphosis. Today I learned that you mustn't use drugs and you mustn't involve with other gangsters and stuff. Because if you if you involve with gangsters, you can you can die quickly. If I think about my life now, 
I've spoken to over 100,000 kids. Just that thought from where I used to be, it blows my mind. I wasn't supposed to be anything. I think with, without Jesus, this definitely wouldn't have been possible at all. It was complete, like it was just gone. All his cravings and desires were just gone. So it's amazing, it really is so amazing. And now that I travel the country speaking and changing people's lives, that's just the grace of God and it's so massive and he's so big and so, so forgiving.